Good day. For the last couple of hours, there's been a lot less information about news from the battlefronts in Ukraine. As I have discussed many times, that is not necessarily a sign that things, important things are not happening. On the contrary, it can be a sign that there's a general tightening up of the situation and that the um, officials, the authorities on both sides, Russian and Ukrainian, are trying to stop information leaking out about um, actual battlefield events. So we have less information about what's going on, except that one important individual, Denis Bushilin, who is the acting head of the Russian-appointed Donetsk government, has just travelled to Bakhmut, where he's carried out an inspection of the situation himself. And he's been discussing uh, some of what he's seen on various uh, Telegram channels, uh, on his Telegram channel, and I suspect he's going to give an interview, and he's promising that before long he's going to tell us an awful lot more. Anyway, he says a number of things. He says that there's um, still fighting going on. He talks about fighting going on in the railway station. I'm not sure which railway station. It's clear to me that Bakhmut has several, but apparently there's intense fighting going on for this railway station. He doesn't tell us exactly which structures um, the Wagner organization has captured in Bakhmut. Um, yesterday, I got the sort of information that the Wagner organization has captured both the Metalurg Stadium, about that I am reasonably confident, and the Avant-Garde Stadium, about which I'm slightly less confident. And as I said in my program yesterday, that it controls around 90% of the town. I think that is also probably reasonably accurate. And um, anyway, um, Bushilin so far hasn't provided information as to exactly what structures have passed under Russian control. But note that the very fact that he's able to travel to Bakhmut at all and apparently visit the place does indicate a certain confidence that the situation there is now confidently moving in Russia's direction. Now, I say that, of course, I do accept and appreciate that Yevgeny Prigozhin, the head of the Wagner organization, regularly goes there, um, visits the front lines, is often seen with his men in, a, the, in these battlefronts. I have no doubt at all that his physical presence is inspirational to his men, but I don't know of any other commander on either side of the war who does anything similar and who, who goes so close to the front lines and puts, them, puts himself at possible risk in that sort of way. And bear in mind that the uh, Ukrainians have made at least one attempt to kill Prigozhin. They launched a missile strike several months ago, as I remember, on a particular location um, on the, um, in, in Donbass, where Prigozhin was supposed to be attending a meeting. In fact, he'd left it some time earlier, and though the structure of the building was destroyed and some people, as I remember, were killed, Prigozhin was not amongst the casualties. Anyway, I've said various things about Prigozhin at various times. I've mentioned the fact that he's not himself the military commander who is in overall charge of the situation on the battlefronts. Um, I said that some of his comments are emotional and perhaps over the top and on occasion even a little unwise. But I must also acknowledge the other thing, that as I said, he does visit the battlefronts regularly. He is there seen by his men, and that must have an effect both on their loyalty to him and on their morale. So just, just to make that very quick point. Anyway, Bushilin has been there. He uh, has been to Bakhmut. He's toured Bakhmut. He's seen what's going on. He seems very confident 
about the progress in the town. But he does reiterate that Ukraine is continuing to hold on grimly to their positions in the west of the town. As I said, he's promising us a more detailed update fairly soon. And I'm going to say, actually, that um, he also talks about the very, very heavy casualties Ukraine is suffering. He talks about Ukraine sending its men to slaughter in Bakhmut. That's become, I'm afraid, something of a trope on the Russian side, which, sad to say, doesn't mean it isn't probably true. <laughs> there have been suggestions from various Russian officials that Ukrainian losses, and I'm talking here about killed in action in Bakhmut, are somewhere between ten and 20,000. I'm not going to try and guesstimate my, provide any guesstimates myself. I'm nowhere remotely equipped to. But what we do see are now increasing numbers of pictures of this deadly road from Chasov Yar to Bakhmut, the one that passes, well, it's two spurs, one passes through Khromovo, the other passes through Ivaniska. I can't tell you which spur of the road these photos come from, and they're now increasing numbers of them. They are making increasingly disturbing sights. They show, show piles of destroyed Ukrainian equipment. I'm glad to say that I haven't seen bodies, though I suspect that there have been many people killed on these roads, but it does look as if <clears throat> Ukrainian, Ukraine is able to evacuate its dead and wounded from the road. I suspect that brief periods of truce are arranged with the Russians in order to enable that to happen. I know it does take place on other battlefronts in the war, and I assume that this is the case here, though it's possible that Ukraine is still able to evacuate its people under fire. But anyway, judging by the number of vehicles that we see damaged and destroyed along the roads, casualties are indeed very high, and the risks of travelling along these roads must be incredibly high. And we get reports on a fairly regular basis that Ukrainian soldiers have, in effect, rebelled against orders to travel up and down these roads, which, incidentally, as I understand it, now only happens at night. But, of course, some still are sent up these roads, either they obey orders or are obliged to obey orders. Again, there's all sorts of stories about people being forced to do this. I'm not going to speculate on the truth of that. But certainly it does look as if these um, casualties are high. And apparently it all very, very much de depends on whether there's Russian drones flying over the road with thermal images. If they are, then any Ukrainian movement on the roads is likely to face very rapid destruction. So, a grim picture. And there's now suggestions that, in fact, one of the reasons why the Russians haven't closed the pincer, the pincers around Bakhmut, um, and Prigozhin himself has said that there was a discussion about closing the pincers within the Russian military. Um, in other words, closing the pincers in a way that would have take, created a tight cauldron inside Bakhmut, but the, the decision was taken not to do so. I speculated that that was partly, that was probably done in order to avoid heavier Russian casualties, given the intense, the intense Ukrainian resistance against closing the pincers that that would have provoked. And also, um, perhaps was intended to end the Battle of Bakhmut faster 
by giving Ukraine some opportunity to retreat, the Russian priority now being to wrap up the battle as soon as possible. Anyway, regardless of that, Prigozhin has said that there was a debate about closing the pincers and that the Russians had the means to do it, but chose not to for whatever reason. And there is now speculation that the one key reason is that the Russians have calculated that since Ukraine continues to send men and supplies or try to send men and supplies into Bakhmut between these pincers, it actually is more economical to destroy these men and these supplies as they go to Bakhmut and it kills and destroys more Ukrainian soldiers and more equipment than it would have been the case if the pincers themselves had closed. It also appears, there's also reports that, of course, Ukrainian troops are sometimes withdrawn from Bakhmut. This talk about continued attempts by Ukraine to rotate exhausted and battered units out of Bakhmut and replace them with fresher ones, that when these units, these exhausted units, try to retreat from Bakhmut, they too risk being caught in the crossfire of the Russian guns. There's a very brutal calculus, a very cruel calculus. I can't obviously speculate, and I have no means to. I, I mean, even if I had the degree of military knowledge, I doubt that anybody who isn't directly informed about the situation on the ground would have any means to say whether these speculations about the Russian decision not to close the pincers uh, are correct. But even if they're not, well, one gets a sense of the overall tragedy. I would say the disaster in this town, human disaster, and of course, in some respects, military disaster for Ukraine. And I gather that there's more complaints about this in Ukraine itself. And no doubt we'll be hearing more when Bakhmut falls, as it certainly will, um, it's now, I think, becoming increasingly clear that there's not going to be a Ukrainian counterattack in Bakhmut any time soon, certainly not before the end of April, and it's doubtful, it seems to me, that the fighting in Bakhmut is going to continue that long. But anyway, one way or the other, we are looking at a very grim picture in Brahmat, indeed. Now, there's been more fighting in other places. There's lots of information, which, again, I find very difficult to assess or understand, about Russian advances near Avdeyevka. As I said, my own guess is that when Bakhmut falls, the Russian priorities will be to capture Chasov Yar and perhaps Konstantinovka to smallish, well, Chasov Yar is basically a village. Ukrainian troops, soldiers have said it's virtually undefendable. Konstantinovka is a rather bigger place, but apparently significantly smaller than Bakhmut. Anyway, that the Russians will want to capture these places, Chasov Yar, Konstantinovka, Bogdanovka, closer to Bakhmut, where fighting is said to be ongoing, um, Orekhovo, Vasilyevka, They'll want, in other words, straighten out the line around Bakhmut in preparation for further advances and no doubt to establish their own defensive positions. In other words, to consolidate. But alongside that, I think the priority will be to capture Sevesk to the north and Avdeyevka to the south. And um, once the Russians have done that, they will be significantly closer once they weather the storm of the Ukrainian counteroffensive. Assume, of course, that they do weather the storm of the Ukrainian counteroffensive. They will be in a position to advance west towards the Dnieper, bringing themselves ultimately opposite the key town of Dniepro, which, by the way, if it happens, will, in my opinion, 
mean the effective end of the war. I think if the Russians reach the east bank of the Dnieper across from Dniepro, then essentially the war is ended. I think that at that point, Ukraine will be in a crisis situation from which I can't myself see that there would be any real prospect of recovery. Now, that that does leave unresolved the bitter fighting that's going on in Marinka and Vugladar. And I have to say about Marinka, um, I've discussed the reliability of Russian reports from time to time. About Marinka, I'm going to say it straightforwardly, Russian reports have often been very unreliable. They, at one point, a couple of months ago, they were claiming that Marinka had been captured, that the Russians had broken into the centre of the town and then captured the town itself. It's clear that was never the case, or even remotely the case, that the Ukrainians were putting up a determined resistance in Marinka, and that at the time when some of those claims about Marinka having been captured um, were being made, in fact, Ukraine was still holding positions still in the central areas of this town. But anyway, it does seem over the last few days that some kind of progress has been made in Marinka. Uh, Pushilin said a short time ago that Ukraine only holds a small part of Marinka. And there's been reports that a tyre factory there has now been captured by the Russians, one of these other big industrial facilities, and that might open the way, perhaps, for a further Russian advance on Marin in Marinka, and perhaps the final resolution of this very long battle. I mean, many people, by the way, who, whenever I discuss Bakhmut, come back and say, well, it hasn't been very impressive. The Russians have taken so long to capture this small isolated town of Bakhmut, which has no strategic significance, and this doesn't really show uh, the Russian military in very good light. I have repeatedly said that I don't agree. I think the prolongation of the Battle of Bakhmut has worked to the Russian advantage, not to the Ukrainian. On the contrary, I think Ukraine's overinvestment in the defence of Bakhmut has been disastrous, and the United States thinks so, apparently. So do many officials in Europe, military officials in Europe, and certainly that's my view. But if you wanted to make that criticism, if you wanted to make criticism that the Russians have made heavy weather of one particular place, then the right place to do it is not Bakhmut, where I think the Russian operations spearheaded by the Wagner organization. So far as I can judge, and remember I'm no expert in these things, have been incremental, methodical, and very effective. If you wanted to make that kind of criticism, then the right place to do it is in Marinka. Now I say that I don't know very much about the nature of the battle in Marinka, but certainly it's been the case that the Russians have given an over-optimistic spin repeatedly of their progress in that particular town. And they have made very heavy weather of it. But anyway, supposedly, and again, in light of these premature claims of victory in the past, I take this now with a cascade of salt, a mountain of salt, but... Anyway, we're getting reports that this tyre factory has now been captured and that it does seem as if, if these reports are true, and I expect that they are about the tyre factory at least, that the Battle of Marinka, this long, slow, grinding battle, is finally coming to some kind of conclusion. In and around Vugladar, a more difficult place, a very difficult place to capture by all accounts, apparently there's been a lot of fighting backwards and forwards. Ukraine has launched several counterattacks on Russian positions. They've been repelled. Russians supposedly are incrementally working to advance around Vugladar. But the key point to make is that the Russian Air Force is now definitely operating actively.
a round of Ouvleda. Um, this is now widely confirmed and it seems clear that the battle of Fulvugleda with Russian aviation now working, that might start to take a different turn again in a short while, perhaps after Bakhmut falls. I am going to say one further point about Vugleda. Vugleda and Marinka, one of the reasons why Ukraine has probably clung on to these places so determinedly, and with some effect, is because if the Russians do capture these two places, it will, if I, my understanding of the geography is correct, and of the transport, the railway networks is correct, if that does indeed happen, then of course the entire project of a Ukrainian offensive in Zaporozhye region would be put in question. And now that brings me <laughs> both to the question of the Ukrainian counteroffensive and to this big document dump. Now, I've made it clear in previous videos that I believe these documents are real. Now, when I made those claims, I, because of the time constraints under which I work, I'd not had opportunities to read what had been written by others, and in particular, I had not had an opportunity to read Larry Johnson at Sonar 21. And Larry, Sonar 21, for those who don't know, son of the American Revolution, 21, uh, read, written by Larry Johnson, is, what, is an indispensable blog about the war. And Larry Johnson is, of course, a CIA, former CIA analyst. He's familiar with American internal documentation, which, of course, I am not. And he's looked at these documents, and he has absolutely no doubt at all about their authenticity. And I consider his expert view on this conclusive. Now, I realise there are lots of other people who think otherwise, but from everything that Larry Johnson says, and I find his um, comments on this, as I said, authoritative and definitive, he thinks these are authentic documents, to my eye, they look authentic as well. And I accept, I think we should all accept that these documents are indeed authentic. There's some suggestions that some of these documents have been manipulated, some of the contents have been manipulated. I am very skeptical about that as well. There's reports from various sides that these are all part of a disinformation exercise, either by the US to deceive the Russians or by the Russians to deceive and confuse the US and its allies. I don't believe that either, nor does Larry Johnson. And I think that, as I said, we should take these documents as true. And we're getting more and more documents, and they're becoming very, very interesting. I mean, we learn, for example, from them that Mossad, the um, Israeli um, intelligence organization, the famous Israeli intelligence organization, appears to have had a hand in the protests um, against Benjamin Netanyahu, the prime minister of Israel in connection with the recent judicial changes there. Now, of course, this has been vigorously denied, as have all sorts of other claims which have been made in these um, documents that refer to third countries. I don't see why people are so sceptical about Mossad's possible involvement in these protests. Anybody who's tracked the history of Mossad will know that as well as being an extremely ruthless and effective intelligence organisation, it's also a highly political one, very much with a mind of its own. And after all, as I also recall during the protests, I, the Israeli defence chief timed his resignation or dismissal in the middle of the protests, making it fairly obvious that the Israeli military defence establishment was not in favour of the judicial changes and backed the protests. But anyway, there have been an awful lot of other um, 
bits and bobs of information. We learn, for example, that the United States is listening in to President Zelensky's telephone calls. I have to say again, I find that completely unsurprising. And in fact, dare I say it, I would think this was a basic precaution for the United States to take, given how heavily it is investing in Ukraine. But anyway, my overall sense, and I think the gradual overall sense that more and more people are getting about these documents, is that what they show is a bleak and chaotic picture in terms of progress of the war from Ukraine's point of view. Now, I want to just say one thing before I just talk about that in a little more detail, and I want to be fairly brief. I had assumed until yesterday that the these documents had been leaked by Russian intelligence. I'm still not fully persuaded that this is not the case, but the gradual emerging consensus is that they were leaked by some American official, obviously angry and embittered, and that some of these documents were already circulating way back in January. So this is not an entirely new leak, though it's obviously a progressing one. So I just want to make that point. But let's go back to what the documents tell us. Firstly, it's clear that um, the force that has been built up for this offensive is around 12 brigades. And as Larry Johnson points out, that could number anything between 30 and 60,000 men. Um, Larry Johnson makes the point that doesn't take into any consideration the enormous logistical forces that would be required to support a force of that size. Uh, Prigozhin has said that Ukraine has around 200,000 men who could potentially participate in the offensive, and there's another 400,000 uh, um, in the rear, a significant force. I think that's probably about correct if we are talking about the total size of the Ukrainian armed forces. In other words, the active forces that Ukraine has on at its disposal number around 200,000, of whom that 60,000, by the way, is a part, and the remaining 400,000 are the second line logistical supply troops. As we know, there's thousands of women now serving in the Ukrainian armed forces. There's also the people who operate the air defences, who, as I said, do all those sorts of things in the rear. And but the actual teeth units number around 200,000. And I think this is about right. So Ukraine is committing perhaps a quarter of its military to this offensive, which, again, seems to me about right. It's clear that training is incomplete, was, was incomplete as of the 1st of March, for some of these brigades that have been assembled. It's also clear that equipment supplies have not been up to the necessary levels. There's concerns about this. And indeed, earlier today, I saw some very, very interesting commentaries that the plan by the European Union to provide a million shells to Ukraine, supposedly over the course of the year, but as Brian Boletic and I both believe, principally over the next couple of months to support the Ukrainian counteroffensive, that that plan has collapsed. The European Union doesn't have that number of shells, or if it does, countries are unwilling to provide that number of shells. There is a general shortage of shells. Production rates are low. It's not possible to keep up with Ukrainian needs for shells, and it's clear that Ukraine is going to launch this offensive without the level of artillery support it perhaps requires. So there's lots of problems there. And in fact, the overall picture 
strongly supports much of the analysis by people like Alex Fashinin and Brian Baletic and others about the inadequacy of supplies. I'm going to say something else, which is that if the attacking force is indeed going to number between 30 and 60,000, let's say 60,000, that may not be anywhere near enough to achieve any kind of decisive breakthrough, given the fact that Russian forces in Zaporozhye region and Kherson region and the regions nearby are apparently fully up to strength and apparently increasingly well equipped and given the enormously elaborate fortified lines that they've built up and given the fact that they will be backed by artillery and aviation, which Ukraine will not be. But of course, this is where we come to the question of aviation, of aircraft, because another report, and it's now widely circulating, and it was commented upon both by the Washington Post and by The Guardian this morning, talks about the critical crisis in the state of Ukraine's air defence system, that Ukraine is running out, or had, it was running out of air defence missiles that if the Russians maintain the pace of their cruise missile attacks on Ukraine's energy infrastructure, bear in mind this report was written in February, Ukraine would run out of book and S-300 missiles by mid-May, or rather by the end of May. Now that is, in my opinion, confirmation of two things. Firstly, that attack on the energy infrastructure undoubtedly had a multiplicity of explanations of causes. Um, John Helmer has written another brilliant piece today about the Russian general staff's preparations for the Ukrainian offensive. He's talked about the Russian cat playing with the Ukrainian mouse. I don't think this is perhaps that far from the truth. But anyway, but um, Helmer has suggested that the Russians were weakening, degrading the Ukrainian energy system, probing its weak points. So when the right moment came, they could launch a heavy strike on it, which amongst other things, as well as knocking out the system, would also paralyze Ukraine's ability to move troop trains and send reinforcements to the battlefronts. That's quite possible. Um, by the way, and on that and in parenthesis, on the topic of the Dnieper bridges, there's now film circulating of a Suhoi-34 fighter bomber, Russian Suhoi-34 fighter bomber, launching a guided rocket, a KH-29 rocket, against a bridge, a Ukrainian bridge, and destroying the bridge. Now, I've previously speculated that the Russians would perhaps use some of their big hypersonic missiles to blow up the bridges. Um, I wonder now, with the Ukrainian air defence system steadily being degraded, whether in fact the plan isn't to bomb the bridges instead with these very big 1,500 kilo precision guided bombs. And that's an interesting thought. One wonders how much damage bombs of that size might do to bridges. Again, I don't know. But anyway, putting all that aside, Helmer talks about this, that there would be at some point a major strike on the communication system. But he also says, and I've no doubt about this is the case, and this leak effectively confirms that the, the principal, one of the principal reasons for those missile strikes was to attack a target, the energy system. Ukraine had no option but to defend, depleting over time Ukraine's stock of air defence missiles. And it is clear that the United States is finding it impossible to make up the numbers. It's been trawling all over the world 
trying to find replacements for the S300s and the books. And it's finding it very difficult. It explains, by the way, or so it seems to me, why Ukraine has been, and the US, have been pushing so hard for Greece to give up its S-300 missile system supplied by Russia, based in Crete. Greece has refused. Anyway, the point is that the Soviet-era air defence system is now almost exhausted. There are supplies now of Patriots and Aspids and other systems coming from the West, but they're not apparently as effective or as combat capable as the old Soviet systems were. And again, I'm not an expert on this, but Brian Boletic has explained this. And in the case of the Patriot and the Espeed, there's only a very limited number of missiles that can be supplied because production of these missiles is small. So that is why we are seeing Russian aircraft operating now in larger numbers increasing numbers using precision guided bombs and they're becoming more effective and Yuri Ignat the defense chief of Ukraine's air defense has actually come out and again has made very bleak assessment of the situation he was asked directly whether this report about Ukraine's stock of air defense missiles being almost exhausted was true he evaded an answer he did come back and say that what he really needs now are not Western systems, missile systems, in which my sense is he has low confidence. What he wants are fighter jets, F-16s. Well, he's not going to get them by the time of Ukraine's counteroffensive, which now is increasingly looking like it's most likely going to happen either at the very end of May, April, or perhaps more probably in May. Anyway. There we go. So, critical shortages of air defence missiles. As I said, Helmer discusses this at length. And there's a very bleak assessment of the prospects of this offensive in the London Times. The same newspaper that exposed the crazy Ukrainian scheme back in October to try to capture, recapture the Zaporozhye nuclear power plant. Again, the Times put an bizarrely optimistic, well, optimistic, favourable spin on the, on the decision to launch that attack. It suggested that Ukraine expected that the Zaporozhye nuclear power station would only be defended by light infantry. They didn't expect to find Russian armour and artillery located there, even as they were using high Mars missiles, apparently, to attack Russian positions in and around the nuclear power plant. Why Ukraine would think that is extraordinary, and it does again call into question whether the intelligence system, the satellites, all of that sort of thing, were anywhere near as effective for Ukraine the ones, you know, that the Americans are supposed to be providing, as legend says. But anyway, I'm not going to go there in this programme. Anyway, the London Times, which exposed that story, has now also given what, despite all the strenuous attempts at spin, is an essentially bleak view of the prospects of this Ukrainian offensive. It says that the offensive is very likely... Ukraine's last throw. Uh, Ukraine does not have enough equipment to keep going much beyond the, this offensive. The ability of the West to keep Ukraine supplied is running low and will probably be exhausted after the offensive. So this is indeed Ukraine's last throw. And it basically concedes that the prospects for this offensive are highly problematic. And it suggests that it all very much depends now on whether um, 
Vladimir Putin supposedly is prepared to risk his precious aircraft in operations over Ukraine. Because if he is, then supposedly the Ukrainian offensive can't work. Well, I think he is. I think we've seen the reasons to see that. I think the Russians are now operating very effectively in their, their aviation. I think Ukraine will try to move such air defence systems as it has closer to the front lines to try to intercept these um, aircraft. That will perhaps make them more visible on the open step, but that's another story. But of course, Ukraine can't denude its air defences everywhere because that will expose them to more attack by the Russians and some of these very new Western systems might not be up to very much either. Anyway, we shall see. But it is an admission from the Times that there are problems with Ukraine's air defence system, that this is Ukraine's last ditch offensive if it fails, if Ukraine doesn't achieve its military objectives. Well, it doesn't quite say that, but the implication is that Ukraine has lost the war. And that's, again, where we come back to Helmer. Helmer's account, uh, which, as I said, is uh, extremely interesting, um, essentially discusses this article in the London Times in detail, and it explains very well, um, as I said, the critical state of Ukraine's air defence and the fact that, as I said in Helmer's words, the Russian cat is now playing with the Ukrainian mouse. Now that, of course, leaves open the fundamental question. If Ukraine's offensive fails or if it only achieves partial success but is unable to achieve a decisive outcome, what then? Does Ukraine continue fighting? With what, in that case? Does the West continue to try and scrabble around, trying to find systems to support Ukraine? Which systems? Is there going to be a diplomatic initiative to end the war? If so, by whom? By the West? By China? I suggested in previous programmes that China is not so much proposing a peace plan for Ukraine now. Rather, it may be positioning itself for a situation where it might act as a mediator, might once military operations over Ukraine have reached what you might call a decisive point, which could very well be at some point in the late summer, early autumn, once the Russians, as I said, have weathered this offensive, assuming, of course, that they do. Anyway, there we go. So that's where we, I think we stand on the battlefronts today. I just want to return to one particular topic, which is Emmanuel Macron and his visit to France. Now, there's been an awful lot of people who have been um, taking a view that, in fact, Macron did actually distance himself from the West, the rest of the West and the United States when he went to France. He's now making all sorts of comments about the need for Europe to achieve strategic autonomy, the need for Europe to reduce its dependence on the dollar, things like that. I get to make my own observation about this. I used this is this is nothing new from Macron. He's talked like this many times. He used to talk like this a lot in the run up to the fighting in February. And once upon a time, I took these comments by Macron seriously, and I learnt my lesson, if you like, um, in January and February 
last year. Because what Macron does is that he does come up with these broad brush statements. The world is de-dollarizing. Europe needs to denuclearize. NATO is brain dead. Things of that kind. They upset and antagonize some people in Europe. They probably don't make some people in the United States at all happy. But when the chips are down, he invariably ends up doing exactly what the Americans want him to do. So over the course of the fighting in Ukraine, he has been one of the most aggressive suppliers of weapons to Ukraine. He has pursued sanctions very aggressively. Um, I think it was his finance minister who actually came out and made a statement early on in the war that the sanctions would cause Russia's economy to crater and collapse. <laughs> and, um, of course, he's taken a very, very hard line in terms of the negotiations. And what was very clear to me last year is that the Russians, who had been somewhat taken in by Macron up to that point, in February, finally lost belief in him. And I think the same is true about Macron. Now, he's going to China. In private, he delivers what appear to be harsh warnings to Xi Jinping, which, as I said, Xi Jinping is clearly very exasperated with and didn't take kindly to at all. He is um, constantly moving about, making all sorts of um, further statements to, in public which appear to contradict these private messages. Point to understand is that what Macron actually did in China was deliver American warnings, or if you prefer, Western warnings to China. And he did that not just on behalf of himself, but on behalf of the European Union, after all, he had Ursula von der Leyen there by his side. Everything else that Macron says about de-dollarization, about NATO being brain dead, about the risks of Europe's deindustrialization, about um, um, the need for Europe to achieve strategic autonomy of the United States, means nothing. I'm not saying that Macron himself doesn't perhaps believe some of this. I suspect because he's a clever man up to a point, he probably does. But ultimately, while he's prepared to say all of these things, his actions tell a different story. And it's his actions one needs to look at. As I said, I was very disappointed by Macron last year. I remember Anatole Levin, the British analyst, saying that Macron had it in his power to prevent a war in Ukraine entirely. All he needed to do was come out and say that France, in principle, opposed NATO membership for Ukraine, and future, he expected that future French governments would adopt the same stance. And that would probably have been enough to end the war, to prevent the war. But Macron didn't do that. He's not going to do that. When, as I said, the chips are down, he always does what the Americans tell him. So I would ask people not to be taken in by Emmanuel Macron. The Russians were, to a great extent. I certainly was. I don't think the Chinese are for one microsecond. So that's all I wanted to say. This is where I finish today. I hope you found this programme useful. More from me soon. To remind you again, you can find all our programmes on Locals, Rumble, BitChute, Odyssey, Rockfin and Telegram. Links under this video um, um, for Patreon and Subscribestar.
and for our shop. And last but not least, have a very good day. Enjoy Easter Monday and um, more from me soon.